Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. I wanted to uh, go over um, a little bit about uh, the idea, the theme of this month, which is Restart, uh, which comes at a really good time for me uh, professionally this year. Um, so I wanted to put that in context a little bit. Uh, before I um, get into talking about my work, I just wanted to uh, pre preface it by saying that um, I've been uh, supported incredibly well by my family for, um, who have really invested in my education and supported all of my uh, professional paths and uh, questions and curiosities. So I uh, began my education, I don't know if you can see me, that's me sitting here in the middle looking pretty, you know. This is, um, <laughs> this is me in high school in Kuwait. Uh, I studied in India and in Kuwait uh, for school. I somehow survived learning chemistry, computer science, physics, uh, maths, with only very minor anxiety attacks. Uh, I realized that, um, at this point, I realized that my body physically knew what was the wrong profession for me. Obviously, your body doesn't just show up and say, this is what you should be doing. But no, it had a physical reaction to things that I could not, uh, that, that I should not be doing. So I took that as a really good, like, um, you know, lead point to, to move on. Um, so that's why the slide was super important, because you can see my mug is up there from, uh, I was 14 years old at the time, <laughs> looking uh, relatively panicked, but also calm. <laughs> this is what it looks like when you're, when you're dealing with an anxiety attack. Um, um, and so moving on, so for college, I chose to study in France. Um, I saw a really compelling art catalog of a, of a school in Paris and decided to apply here. Uh, at the time, obviously, I didn't know that this was one of the toughest schools uh, in Paris to study art and design. Uh, the alumni of the school are super illustrious artists like Cassandre, Jean Dubuffet, Marcel Duchamp, Henri Matisse, and so on. Uh, going in, obviously, as a tourist, I had absolutely no idea who these people were. Uh, I'm coming in from a science background in high school uh, in Kuwait, so I was like, okay, those sound like whatever names, we'll look that up later, but you know, like, <laughs> the, 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 the importance of that was lost on me at the time. Uh, but uh, to say that it felt like a military school for art was an understatement. It was one of the most rigorous programs uh, to train you, not only in your fine art skills, but things like um, punctuality, perseverance, attention to detail, all of which obviously mattered to me later, um, later in my career, but these were some skills that, there were some rock solid skills. Um, it, and the only thing that carried me through this super difficult learning curve was my maddening obsession with line um, and shape and, art, uh, and color and form. Uh, an eight-hour drawing session at the Louvre, for instance, seems to seem to fly by so fast because I was completely lost for those eight hours uh, in what I was trying to work on and trying to uh, sort of crack the code or try to cr figure out how my eyes and hands could coordinate. Um, and the academic pressure of the school was extremely high, but it also meant that every time I failed at subjects, I was so obsessed in figuring it out. I mean, I was just... I was so bad at typography when I started, and I was so, so adamant to figure this out that by the end, um, all of Switzerland literally said, we lose, you have, we have you. <laughs> if, you if, you're, if you're a type nerd, you know what that means. Uh, but this is basically just to say that uh, the formation was incredibly uh, difficult for me going in from a background that uh, didn't have any fine arts until then. Um, and after Paris, I did a little bit of freelance in Paris, and then I moved to New Delhi in India. Uh, I had one of the best experiences working in corporate branding. I got the opportunity to work for um, some of the country's uh, leading fashion designers, real estate homes, uh, real estate companies, uh, multimedia projects for hotels, nonprofits, a number of uh, leading, but it was very corporate, but at the same time, it taught me to um, really deliver on an extremely tight timeline. So, um, in Paris, I may have learned the technicalities of different, uh, different aspects of design and branding, but this is where I was really allowed to experiment and, uh, and see if these things actually had a result. <clears throat> um, and uh, going forward, I wanted to go back to grad school again because I wanted to de develop my studio practice. So the framework for the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan seemed to fit into what I was looking for at the time because 
Uh, on one hand, I really wanted to develop my studio practice, my research writing. Um, and the design program at Cranbrook, at least uh, in graphic design, was a very unique program. Uh, is still a very unique program. And one of the main takeaways for this program was how to learn to write about my artistic practice and to receive helpful criticism in a way that benefits your work. Um, it's super hard to hear uh, difficult things about your work, uh, but it's even, uh, it's even tougher to uh, see if there's any truth to what you're hearing and use, those use that feedback to make your work better. So uh, these were some of the things that I learned there. Um, huge shout out to the incredibly complex uh, transformational pro uh, process that they put you through. Um, and one of the other, uh, other things that I did there, one of the reasons I chose to go to Cranbrook was one, to develop a studio practice, but the second one was also to incubate uh, a small company that I was thinking to start with my mom. So um, um, around the same year that we started, uh, around the same year that we st I started Cranbrook is when we registered our company officially. Uh, this was in 2007. Um, so the framework and discourse at Cranbrook was very consequential to how our business evolved. Um, essentially, our company is, is still till date an experiment to see if good design could, proper, could positively impact rural artisanal communities. So we took up the cause of handloom weaving in our hometown in southern India, in Kerala. Uh, so we decided that by merging ethical trade and uh, transparent business practices along with traditional weaving techniques and graphic design fundamentals, basically the fundamentals of branding. We decided to mix these three, um, and our company exists at the intersection of these three fields. Uh, and so we are able to create a brand that is modern, um, benefits artisans, and more importantly, ensures that it protects a local craft form from disappearing. So this was, um, this was around, this, the, the framework of Cranbrook helped me incubate uh, my business as well. Uh, we started at the time to get a lot of national and international press, and things were picking up really fast. So after Cranbrook, uh, what I decided is I was really excited to get into teaching. Uh, I took up full-time teaching at the Grand Valley State University in um, Grand Rapids, West Michigan. Uh, simultaneously, my company was re transitioning from a retail to a wholesale model. So teaching graphic design while growing my social enterprise was one of the most rewarding and most challenging things I've ever done. Um, I pretty much did not sleep for those years that I was teaching and working because uh, full-time faculty and uh, working on a startup as uh, a full plate. But the one takeaway again was that in my teaching I tried to be 100% transparent about um, the successes that we had as a company but also a lot of our failures and roadblocks because I feel like beyond good design and intent, um, my graphic design students, I felt like they really needed to see how things un, un, um, progress in the real world, you know, in the professional world. So, and one of the big takeaways I had, and this is again going back to something I learned at Cranbrook, is that uh, students learn as much by watching how their professors excel in different fields as they learn in watching them stumble and overcome roadblocks. So that was something, uh, as we are going through basic design fundamental classes or advanced or any of those, uh, once I always have uh, my personal work process also accessible to them so they can see where we're at right now, what are the kinds of things I'm working on and how do we succeed or fail or, you know, I, I, I believe that allowing that transparency allow, helps students to really um, excel and problem solve and think for themselves. So that was, uh, um, and two years later, I quit teaching to move to Boston to be with my husband. And this is the time that I really focused full time on my social enterprise, Cara Weaves. So this is the time we grew our partnerships and our own team. So we are currently a team of about 10 people in our office in India, and we work with over 800 weavers and tailors across uh, different cooperatives in southern in Kerala. And we've done some amazing collaborations so far, um, some uh, super uh, um, important and some very kind and socially forward-thinking brands like um, the Little Market out of LA, ABC Carpet and Home, uh, William Sonoma, and most recently, I think last week, was Bloomingdale's. So uh, in the past, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> thank you. Um, but it's really, uh, it's so heartening for us to see 
um, the artisanal work and, and also for our weavers to get to see the, the, where the places that their products are sold at. Um, so in the past 11 years, we have creatively problem solved through a number of issues and have a very competing team uh, handling operations. In my personal life, when we moved to San Diego, I had had a baby. We moved here and discovered the amazing community here. So on to the next slide, which, is the most, um, which I think is the most interesting. Um, as a graphic designer, my role at Caravives is very involved. So right from I'm designing new products to branding, the online store management, social media, as well as coordinating logistics. Uh, but the physical distance from my team combined with raising a child here meant that I couldn't be in India as much uh, during the year to work on different things. So that left me some time to rethink my career again. Um, a year or so back, I figured out, I started, I figured out the formula in a way to maintain, uh, to sustain my work at Kara, you know. And around that time, I was starting to plateau out because, you know, the most challenging thing in, uh, the, the most interesting thing for a lot, of a lot of people is to figure things out. And once you figure things out, you're like, okay, now what next? Or what do you do next from here on out? Um, I um, started to introspect a little bit more and I reached out to friends and family and, and met up with a group of very creative and entrepreneurial women here, um, the, the local community, the design community. I attended an amazing series of career workshops by Michelle Watson called Dream Driven, uh, where I met several other wonderful women who ran local uh, organizations. So, and also one of the, uh, the one of the Creative Mornings talk from earlier this year, Gary Ware, I believe he's here. <laughs> yeah, so I was in the audience that day and it totally blew my mind. And it was also the time that I was thinking about what I should be doing next. Um, it was hugely impacting on what I did next. Um, uh, everything, I mean, all the meetings I had and the discussions, they all seemed to point back to, you know, the idea that Gary had in his talk about going back to what uh, you love to do as a child or what you love to do, you know, where you lost yourself completely. And for me, that always went back to um, a little, uh, something about uh, working on my fine art, uh, starting my studio practice. But, you know, as with most people, I talked myself out of that too, successfully. I was like, what would I possibly paint that anybody would care about. As a graphic designer, you're tuned to, you know, to, uh, to meet with people who have a design need and solve that problem. When you're asked to author something yourself, you're like, what point of view do I have and what, what would I possibly do paint that anybody would care about? So, you know, a painter with a capital P, that's like a huge mantle to carry. So, um, being a parent makes you super vulnerable, but you know, it also makes you fearless as hell because an actual human being is looking up to you. An actual human being actually depends on you and thinks of you as a role model. So that stuff, sometimes, if I wasn't a parent at that particular point in my life, I may have just talked myself out and comfortably stayed whatever I was doing. But having a child sort of like puts you on the edge of things. So I started um, to attend life drawing sessions in my area and I started to make a few doodles and started making a few paintings. Obviously, the topic that was really playing on my head at the time, and it still does, um, it's one of those irrevocable roles, is that of being a mother. So I started sharing my process on social media because I felt like I started showing the successes, the failures, the, I'm pretty transparent about my process, and I thought that I'm just gonna put it out there just to show the work. And, and I also shared some finished pieces that were up there. Uh, and somehow, magically through that, it led to the sale of my first painting. And that's when I was like, what? Like, people want this, people want to hang it in their house and look at it, and, but it's my, my, my thoughts, but it's on the, their, their house, their canvas. Like, I was like, so like, blindsided by that. But that um, sale sort of like emboldened me to um, do more things. So here's a case in point. Um, around this time, I saw a call for entries for a show up in San Francisco about the world of Frida Kahlo. So Frida Kahlo was, a, I mean, as a painter whose work uh, greatly influenced me when I was a young art student in Paris. Uh, and the jury for this show um, comprised of one of my favorite illustrators, Lisa Congdon. So I sort of um, took these two things as a sign of. Uh, the, the, the women whose work I really admired and went all out and painted um, and learned how to make an oil painting. And I went all out with symbolism about motherhood and different things. Uh, so the week of the deadline, my son was home with the flu. 
uh, fun times. My husband was traveling for work, and here I am uh, painting about the struggles of motherhood while dealing with the struggles of motherhood. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like sitting in this chair, I'm holding my son, checking his temperature, while I'm painting on the other, and he's watching cartoons, obviously. Um, <laughs> So that was, you know, possibly the craziest moment. I'm like, what is this, you know? And obviously, I, I mean, I turned in my work like a few hours before the deadline. And as it would have it, um, the next day he was fine. He went back to school the next day. This was just like a drama for me. Um, <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, a few days later, I got an email that uh, my work was selected for the show. And I just like sat down. I just sat down on the ground. I was in the kitchen, I remember. And I took a few minutes and I was like, I had so many feelings about this. I was like, oh my God, this is crazy. I mean, I barely made it. First soil painting, sick, kid is sick, and it's in. And like, what does that mean, you know? <laughs> so this was like a really small victory, but it really emboldened me to send in more work to shows. And uh, there were a lot of rejections and some acceptances. But more importantly, I felt that I was putting my deepest um, insecurities and vulnerabilities on a canvas, which somehow connected to people. Um, and I felt that, you know, um, it was in a way cathartic to make work about it, but also incredibly humbling and amazing to connect to an audience through it. Um, so this is where I'm at right now. I mean, I'm sorry, you can't see the work well, but uh, in the morning, I'm on calls with uh, my mom and my team in India. In the morning, we're working on our logistics and different things with our so, with my social enterprise, we're working to resolve things. And during the rest of the day, I paint like my life depended on it, because it does. Um, you're welcome to follow along my process at uh, my website. I try to showcase a lot of what drives my work, and again, like all of the things that don't work out. And I, on social media, I also talk about uh, parenting in the midst of all this, because that literally informs the amount of time I can dedicate to both these things. Uh, but as far as possible, I try to put out the most authentic uh, experience that is happening. Uh, but the takeaway here, you know, for you, I feel like the takeaway, uh, the idea of a restart is so much more applicable to us right now more than ever, because as people, our lifespans are increasing, and the number of years that we actually spend in a profession is much higher than uh, our family before us. Um, and, the, and that puts us at a, at a huge potential for a burnout. Um, the other thing is technology is so disruptive, so what um, the workplace practices that we were used to before may be becoming redundant right now or saturated. So all these things put us in um, the idea or put us at the edge of, um, you know, rethinking what we're doing and taking a step back and being easily burnt out. And, but the other thing is not to forget, we're really good, we're really, ex we're experts at talking ourselves out of doing something. So as being, as being a, an authority on that, I can tell you that it's like the first instinct is to tell yourself that, you know, yeah, but that's like, Painters is like, somebody else is a painter, not me. I'm like something else. I have run a company, I have a, I have a kid, I'm not a painter. So you talk yourself out of stuff, right? But I've realized that uh, more than anything, like back to my first slide when I was a, a teenager in Kuwait, when my body physically reacted to things, I feel like I don't pay enough attention to that and I need to follow my gut. And I feel like um, this is a huge takeaway for, from my experience or my career path. Uh, that there is no like set definition to be in one profession for the rest of your life. You should allow yourself the grace and the space to uh, try out um, more than one thing if they're essential to exercising different aspects of your personality and your skill sets. You may have skill sets that you are completely, uh, not completely ignoring because you feel like there's, there's another bigger title that you're carrying in life. And the takeaway here is to sort of, you know, think with your gut more. Um, so for me, it has been about my social enterprise and my artistic practice. For you, it may be medicine and poetry or accounts and ballet or uh, whatever, uh, whatever is your like, secret superpower that nobody knows about. Um, and as a wise female philosopher once said, get your freak on. <laughs> Thank you.